back in 2 Corinthians, we're in chapter 7. And Corinthians, the way that we teach it line upon line can feel like, oh man, is we ever going to stop getting beat up? And it, it's a corrective, both 1 and 2 Corinthians are corrective books. They're, they're, they're for correcting us not only on the outside, but on the inside. And it's really easy to look at other people and go, oh, you really got a problem, and, and not really pay attention to some of the things that we need to deal with. And this Corinthian church that I make lightly of, I call it the naughty church, and they're wealthy. They live in a, they live in a high-end place with ex- great resources and, and great wealth. And they're also a church that's filled with spiritual gifts. Um, they're a church that's been really, really blessed by God, and yet we find it's one of the most carnal churches that are spoke of in the Bible. And we can look at this and go, oh, you carnal people. But it's the same flesh that lives inside you and me. They're just not shutting it down. And there's times and places that, that we need to shut this stuff down that runs in our life. One of the greatest dangers to the church is discontentment. And I've watched churches split over colors of carpet. You know, um, I've watched churches split over the way things are done. You know, things that bless some people and don't bless you or, you know, and when discontentment becomes a cancer, basically, to the church, it, it, it divides it, it separates it, it, it brings more people discontentment that wouldn't have discontentment. And so it's really important to understand that not every church is going to meet all of your needs. And that's why it's so awesome that we have different churches. We have, you know, a Pentecostal church was way more expressive. Um, We have a Baptist churches that are way drier, but way more, you know, um, fundamental type of things. We have different bodies in the body of Christ. And if, if a church is not meeting your need, look, I don't want anyone to ever leave ever. But if a church is not meeting your needs, um, there's probably a church that could. And as much as we would miss you, we would rather have you go to a church that's meeting your needs than to have you be discontent and then spread discontentment. And this is what Paul's having to deal with in these churches. He's dealing with people that are, that are, are discontent. And so that breeds in them and then breeds around others. There's nothing wrong with looking for something different for you that meets your needs. It, 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 and it shouldn't be. And pastors should not be ugly about it. When, you know, I've got some great friends that are going to different churches. And I'm just glad that they're in a church that's meeting their needs. Do I miss them? Absolutely. I love th- I see people as gifts to the body. When someone comes into the church and, and they serve, I just see them as gifts for God's body. I see them as hands reaching out that I can't reach out to. I would love to know every one of you and know everything about every one of you, but it's physically and mentally impossible for any human to do that. So as people in the church reach out to other people, it's, it's the body now spreading out into areas that it could never do. And every single Christian has been given a gift to serve God in some ways. And when everyone's using those gifts in the body, man, a church just thrives. We've got a lot of amazing people in this church. Um, We've lost a lot of amazing people in this church that moved out of California in the last couple years. And we've lost some amazing people from going to to be with the Lord. Every time I look up at the worship team, my heart hurts because of Kristen. You know, the, the presence that she had, the... You know, she's amazing. There's, there's people that were on my right hand and left hand side that helped me with every decision that are, are now gone. And, and so we wait for God to raise someone else. And we started this church understanding that we would only be able to do with what God provided the gifted people to bring to the church. And we would be content with what we had until God brought us. We didn't start ministries when we didn't have the people. 
We didn't start things that we didn't have the ability to take on because me and Mike came from a place that was starting something new every week and then they experimented on the church. And when something starts and then fails right after, it starts to wear people out. So we always look for that man or that woman that has a passion and the gifting and the faithfulness to be able to take that and not just, see there's a lot of people that could tell you what the church should be. But there's not a lot of people that say, hey, I want to help the church get to that place. Well, these Corinthians, they're wealthy, they've got money, they've got success. They've forgotten to be grateful for what they have. Um, they, they start to compete with each other. This is church. This is not the world we're talking about. This is happening in church. Now, I'm not teaching this because I think that we're in the middle of something right now that we have to deal with. I'm teaching this so we won't get in the middle of something that we have to deal with. And I don't teach this because none of this stuff sticks to me, you know? And so I don't want to wear you out with all this correctiveness, but we have to hear it so that we're prepared. We're not willing to fall into these traps. And so, Paul, if you need to understand, chapters and verses got put in the Bible because we needed a way to find where the pastor was talking about. When I say turn to 2 Corinthians 7, can you imagine if I said turn to three quarters of the Bible because there's a message in there that I'm going to teach you? You guys would spend the whole service trying to find out where I was. So they put chapters and verses in the Bible. They're not the holy chapters and verses. The word is. But the chapters and verses are in there so that we can all find a place or go to a direction in the Bible. Well, you know, last week in chapter 16, 17, it fits really good coming into chapter 7. So I back up a little bit, and, and I'll show you how that works and why that works. Um, we read in 6, 17, and you will be, and I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I, I said last week that God becomes our father while we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But he cannot be to us a father unless we obey him and fellowship with him. He longs to receive us in love and treat us as his precious sons and daughters. Now, salvation means that we share the father's life. But separation from worldly thinking which it means we share an intimacy with God. Um, when God's not having to correct us, he gets to just pour love on us. And, and you go back to the simplicity of your child, raising your child. You don't want to spend all your time correcting that child. It's not your goal. You, you correct the child so that they behavior becomes one of a love relationship, one that you can bless. You know, you think about a child going, I want, I want, a gimme, 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 gimme. It's really hard to bless that because by blessing that, you're encouraging that, so you have to do correction. But you watch your child see another child that has a want or a need of something, and they hand them their favorite thing because they see that, and you want to rush to the store and buy them 10 of them. You know, that simplicity helps you understand a little bit who the father is when we're in obedience god didn't put rules in because he's an because he's a control freak or something like that god put rules and symptoms into place because they're the best things for us it's what we're created for and so those things that now the world rejects those things that look like the opposite of what truth is in the world's view weren't put out there to bum us out or to pick on people or, you know, it was put there to keep us from becoming the people that we see we've become as a nation. They were put there to protect us. And when we live in that obedience, God can be like that parent that just wants to bless his child for their obedience. Let's look. Chapter 7, verse 1. I went back because he said, and I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters. And verse 7 says, because we have these promises. That's the promises he's talking about. Dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our bodies or spirit. Too often Christians deal with the symptoms, 
but not the causes. We keep confessing the same sins because we haven't gotten to the root of the trouble and cleansed ourselves from within side. You think of the prodigal son. He was guilty of sins of the flesh. The guy was worldly, living like dirt, like the world, wiping himself out. And you see the sin so simple on the outside. But the more older brother, he was guilty of sin in the spirit, on the inside. He was jealous. He was full of envy, covetousness. And that was a spiritual thing inside. God wants our outside and our inside to be cleansed, to live right. There's a cleansing that God does in our life when we became a Christian, but there's a cleansing in our life that we're responsible for. He doesn't force us to behave. He doesn't force us to do the right thing. That's free will is love. An all-powerful God gave you and me the opportunity to choose to love him, to choose to obey him. Man, you think about that. It takes a lot. Here Paul's talking about a cleansing that just isn't something God does as we sit passively. This is a self-cleansing. It's for an intimacy with God that goes beyond a general cleansing for our sin. To get close to God that way, obedience is critical. It means doing what's right no matter how I feel. There's a right thing and that's God's ways no matter what the world's ways are. And it goes on to say, and let us work towards complete holiness because we fear God. Holiness. It comes from a fear of God, but not like a fear of a bear or a human being. It's a constant and continuous process as we grow in grace and knowledge of God. We can get this from his word and that's why we put so much preference into teaching his word in this church. There are churches that are jumping around and hooting and hollering and the word of God's not even being spoken. It's, you know, I, I see what happens in the world that we live in the name of church and it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. You can feed people's flesh easily. Yeah, but the problem that lies in a ministry that's built off feeding your flesh, what do you do tomorrow to top it? And that's why you'll see, you know, the gift of tongues is an amazing gift, but we watched it so blown out of proportion, blown out of the way that the Bible speaks about it, that people began to bark in the spirit. People began to run around the buildings and jump around and, you know, Not everyone understands our worship team. You know, first of all, I go back to when we started the church. We never knew if anybody was coming. And we would hope that somebody would show up. And and we just, so, you know, when we have three people, it's, you know, sure, I'd love to have Hillsong up here, but they're not coming. But I'm so grateful for the three people that came. You know, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for them. And I've had people that wanted to be on the worship team, but they wanted to entertain, you know? And, then, and I remember being back in my youth ministry, not youth, but my college ministry, there was a guy that, that danced around and, and spun around, and all I heard through the congregation of these young people is, oh man, he's amazing, oh he just loves the Lord, that guy's incredible, I just love to watch him, and, and all this is going on, and I'm going, are you worshiping, or are you watching this guy entertain you? See, this should almost be invisible as we do worship, and our minds and hearts should be to the Lord. But there are people that entertain, and it's got to be very difficult for a worship person to be able to hide behind that because they don't want you looking at them. They want you looking to the Lord. Their job is to, to actually disappear up here and bring you in that. And not everyone understands that, and not everyone feels that. There are people that want to be entertained. 
But I, I watch churches that try to entertain people and, and they start doing goofy things. And then they're watching the person that's dancing down the hallway all the way, hallelujah, hallelujah, and up over the chairs and running around. I, I've watched it where that's going on so much, they cut the pastor off from teaching. The worship team took over. I mean, I've seen the excesses to the point where you're just going, what are you thinking? In our schools today, we're not allowed to call a boy a boy or a girl a girl, a father a father, or a mother a mother. Kids can call themselves cats. Can, can you even believe that? There's a group of kids in the youth ministry, right? not in the youth ministry, but in, in the junior highs right now that are telling their teachers that they're not a human, they're a cat, and they're going around the classroom meowing. They're not allowed to tell them that they're not cats. You allow sin to start moving, and it never stops. It, if it's in the flesh, it has to be kept in the flesh, it has to be built in the flesh, and it will, ever, it will always turn into people acting like cats or some other madness. And this is the world that we live in. We want to have an attitude of reverence for God, and that will produce obedience and that's what holy means. When we sing holy, when we speak holy, it means that I'm separate, set apart, different than the world, unto God. And in that, it's a great relationship. It doesn't get better. We never have more peace. If there's no peace in your life, if there's turmoil in your life, if you're dealing with discontentment all the time, turn it down. Spend more time with the Lord. I was talking to somebody the other day about prayer time, and sometimes people get that confused. They, they get thinking that it, it needs to be something real flowery and, 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 and poetic and everything to spend time with God and talk with God. I got news for you. God wants to talk to you like you talk to me. God wants to hear from you. He wants to hear your thoughts. He wants to hear your, your fears. He wants, to, he wants to hear your excitement and your fun. He wants to hear your gratefulness. God just likes to hear from you. And you don't have to speak weird or different or, or, or anything else to do that. We have a father that loves to hear. It, it, it's mind-boggling that the creator of heaven and earth and all the human beings that live on the face of the earth, he wants to hear from you and me. It, it, it's it's mind-boggling. And yet... That's how big our God is. And sometimes we lose that perspective. Now, I find it amazing here that Paul could write, cleanse ourselves. This is the holiest man I've ever read about. And he includes himself among the Corinthian Christians. If we ever get to the point where we think that we're beyond cleansing ourselves, that there's nothing wrong with me, it's everybody else, we're, 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 in, we're a mess. We're a mess. And our flesh would love to do that. That's something that we battle. If Paul could include himself among those that needed to be cleansed, man, we better be doing it too. We have to be sure. Most of the time we're more concerned about someone else's holiness than we are our own. Haven't you noticed that someone that's living in disobedience always finds everyone else's faults? Every time. It's so much easier. Verse 2. Please open your hearts to us. Paul's not correcting them because he's mean or brutal or anything. You get to see the tenderness of him. He loves this church. And he's broken hearted to see the direction that some of these people, not all the people, but that some of these people are heading in. And he says, please open your hearts to us. We've not done you wrong in any way, nor led anyone astray, nor taken advantage of any of you. He's trying to reach their memories. He's trying to restore the time that he spent with them, the love that he showed to them, the dedication, the faithfulness he's given these Corinthians. He's pleading with them not to be taken in with people that are spreading division. We have really short memories, don't we? 
We forget the things that God did for us yesterday. We're on to the next thing so quickly. What have you done for me lately is so common in the thought process of human beings, all of us. He goes on in verse three to say, I'm not saying this to condemn you. It's not his heart. I said before that you are in our hearts and we live and die together with you. Verse four, I have the highest confidence in you. I I love that about Paul because when someone's misbehaving, it's not easy to have the highest confidence in them. But that's Paul's heart. He saw the best, he saw the best in people. He saw what they could be, not what they were. And he never gave up praying, he never gave up pleading, and he never came up trying to lead a life of example. Now, did Paul fail? Yeah, we saw his failures in the Bible. You know, until we get to heaven, we're not gonna be perfect. We're work in process. But the intent of Paul is so powerful here. I have the highest confidence in you, and I take great pride in you, not pride in himself. Do you know what it says to me when someone comes in and says, this church changed my life? I never understood the word of God till I got here. Do you know what that does to the inside of me? There's just... There's no material thing that could compare to the joy of that. That God used me, me, of all people, in some way, through his Holy Spirit to accomplish that. I mean, i have been one of the top novice bodybuilders. I was, uh, everything I've done in life, I've, I've accomplished. Contractor and, and all of Starbucks, Northern California electrical contracts, and you know, and, and all the things I've ever done, and nothing pale. It all pales. It all pales that somebody would understand God on a level that they never did before, that their life has been changed, that they're going to have rewards in heaven that they can't comprehend. It, it just doesn't get any better. It puts everything in perspective. He says, you have greatly encouraged me and made me happy despite all our troubles. He's just saying it was all worth it. I wonder why sometimes it's so hard to assure people of your love for them. I've been amazed to see people that I've poured into for a decade all of a sudden that quick and I just, I just look and I go, do I do that, Lord? Do I allow that, Lord? Please don't let me do that. Help me, help me, Lord. A lot of times it's people taking other people's offense. Do you know what that guy did to me? They don't even know what that guy did to me, but they hear someone else's offense. Again, I share that thing my mom says, believe nothing you hear in half of what you see. And there's so much in that. You don't know what's behind decisions that have been made. As a pastor, you have to make some decisions that nobody in the church can know about. Pastor can't get up here and say, this person's doing this and they're doing that and nobody knows about it and that's why I can't let them do this. And yet, the person can be telling everybody, that pastor, he's no good, he won't let me be on the worship team. I remember years ago with my dad, and me and my dad were like this. I'm my best buddy. I love that guy. And he had a tender heart. He's like Tony Chavez. He'd have a million people at his house all the time. And when there was a lady causing a lot of trouble in the church and she was gossiping and she was, she was stirring up stuff everywhere and she wanted to be on the worship team. And I, I couldn't put her on because of the, and I won't go into details, and, and she's not around. And it's, but I couldn't put her on the worship team. But she found her way to get to about everybody's house in the church and say that pastor won't let me on the worship team and he's jealous of my voice and, 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 and all the stuff that went on. And, and so she went to my dad's house and, 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 and just poured out this thing. And I remember walking into the house and my dad goes, you in that church? Now you've been coming for all this time. He goes, you in that church and what's going on is just not right and, I'm, and I'm just taken back. I'm just, I'm just going. And there was a group of people in, in the room and I said, dad, can, can we go outside? Dad, you have known me since I was a child. You watched what I gave up to do this ministry. You watched 
what I did with my life. You watched what I've done with every one of your friends and every one of the people that are there. Does any of that sound like me? I said, Dad, there were things that I can't talk about that kept that from happening. And he started to cry. He goes, I should have known. I should have known. All of us can do this. Here's our best friend, my dad. You know, all of us can do this. And we, we just have to be so careful of it. You know, the enemy is always attacking a work of God. Do we fear that? Absolutely not. Church, we know who wins. We know who wins. But I warn us about discontentment because discontentment spreads and it causes evilness. And if something's, you know, like I said, if something's not work, now if sin is, if the pastor's having an affair or the pastor's stealing money or the pastor's lying to everybody or the pastor's not paying his bills or something like that, get out of that church and bring everybody with you. But if you don't like the color of the carpet, come on. And, and, I, and I'm not telling you this because you guys are doing I don't want to do that in my life. He says, you've, you've encouraged me, even though all our troubles. But sometimes it's hard to understand how people haven't, convinced, haven't been convinced of your love for them. Paul was willing to die for them if necessary, they were in his heart. He boasted about them to others while they criticized him. And it's just human nature. It's one of the things we have to battle. Verse five, when we arrived in Macedonia, there, were no, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. Interesting. But God, that's Tony's two favorite words, but God, who encourages those that are dis discouraged. That's interesting. Fear and discouragement, Paul. Encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. His presence was a joy, but so was the news he brought of the encouragement he received from you. When he told us how much you longed to see me again, and how sorry you were for what happened, and how loyal you are to me now. I was filled with joy. Nothing's better to watch someone turn from a direction that was damaging and get right. Even the great apostle got discouraged. You get to thinking that he just did, and he's Superman. He's human. And he was encouraged by the report that Titus gave to him, how they now treated him when he went to, because the people that went there representing Paul weren't treated well in the past. And that they had read Paul's painful letters, the ones that we're reading. These were not fun for Paul to write. Correction's not fun. If you're gonna correct and expect someone to go, well, thank you for giving me that, and I'll be much better, you're in for it. You know, you're in for it. It doesn't happen a lot. But I've watched through time for people that it did. See, if you speak the truth in love, you don't have to apologize. If it comes from your heart in the Lord and you've prayed about it, you've done your job. Now it's the responsibility of the person that's hearing. Um, they read these painful, painful letters and what they did was they repented of their sins. Many of them did. And they actually had to discipline some of the members who were creating the problems to keep the church healthy. Verse eight, I'm not sorry that I sent severe letters to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful. It was painful to you for a little while. It's important to keep remembering why he had to send these letters. He didn't just send them because he wanted to. He sent them because this church is coming apart. This sorrowful visit was mentioned in 2 Corinthians 2, 1, as we started after the failure of this visit that he made, Paul decided not to go back to Corinth for a while, and he sent Titus to them. And he sent them with these strong letters, and Paul was very worried. You know, when you have to correct, you don't go into it looking forward to it. You're concerned. He was worried that they would be received 
and then life would be changed, there would be different direction. He was hoping and he was worried that they may reject God himself. And that's something that you wanna really be prayed up about when you have to correct. You don't wanna cause people to reject their faith and everything else because they're unhappy with you, but then again, you don't wanna allow a cancer to keep growing. But Caiaphas comes back with this great news from the Corinthian Christians, and, and, and you can just hear in Paul's voice, he's totally relieved. You can tell that he spent nights not sleeping. Verse nine, now I'm glad that I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. So you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in a spiritual death. Godly sorrow brings repentance and it changes someone's attitude and there isn't regret. But worldly sorrow we're taught brings death and destruction. You know, the difference we see in the Bible is between Judas and Peter. Both of those guys failed greatly. But Judas, if you think about it, was full of regret. He went and hung himself. But Peter wept and repented of his fall and went on to serve God powerfully. And that's the difference between being sorry for something and then being sorry for something and doing something different in the future. Changing your direction. Do Christians need to repent? If you're sitting here thinking, no, I don't. Well, listen what Jesus said. Luke 17, three and four. So watch yourselves. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. Then if there is repentance, forgive that person. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you must. Now, it's not saying that get punched in the face seven times and then say it's okay and get there punched seven times again. You can forgive someone and remove yourself from that person causing you harm without being sinful. You just can't live in, in, in anger. And, and you've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. God calls you to do that. But it doesn't say that you have to be a punching bag for anyone. We need to understand, I can't wait to start teaching Revelation again when we get there, especially in the times that we're living in. Four of the seven churches of Asia Miser listed in Revelations 2 through 3 were commanded to repent. It's not the world that's being spoken of here. These are four of the major seven churches. He says, turn and go in a different direction or you're done. Repent, to change someone's mind. A Christian that's living in, dis living in disobedience needs to repent. Not in order to be saved, but in order to restore their close fellowship with God. This is what this is all speaking about, is being tighter with God, not allowing our flesh to keep us from that intimacy that God has for us. You don't want to correct your child the rest of your life. Neither does God. He wants to bless him. Verse 11, just see what this godly sorrow produces in you. Such earnestness, such concern to clear yourselves, such indignation, such, as, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal, such readiness to punish what's wrong. You showed that you have done everything necessary to make things right. You have gone in a different direction, you have been obedient, and nothing makes me happier. Verse 12, my purpose then was not to write about who did the wrong or who was wrong, I wrote to you so that the sight of God, so that in the sight of God, you could see for yourself how loyal you are to us. We have been greatly encouraged by this. In addition to our own encouragement, we're especially delighted to see how happy Titus was about the way all of you welcomed him and set his mind at ease. 
I had told him how proud I was of you, and you didn't disappoint me. I have always told you the truth, and now my boasting to Titus has also proven true. Now he cares for you more than ever when he remembers the way all of you obeyed him and welcomed him with such fear and deep respect. Godly sorrow produces repentance. It shows a fear that we could ever fall in the same sin again. I have a good, healthy fear of things that could cause me to fall from the Lord. You go, why, why would you say that, Pastor? Because I have watched some of the most brilliant, talented, gifted people of God fall. I've seen some of my very favorite pastors, teachers, fall. They allowed a tiny bit of sin into their life that consumed them. Most of the time, pride stepped in. Pride scares me to death. It'll jump on top of you fast. Every stupid thing I've ever done in life, I can look back and see pride was it. It sneaks in so quickly, you don't even know it's there. I pray constantly, Lord, don't let me let it happen. You don't give anything an inch that can destroy you. And there's so much in this world that can take us out. Number one thing that takes pastors out is sexual immorality. Number two thing is finances. It, it, it happens to, to, to guys that, that, are, that are, are, are unbelievable. Do I have a fear? Absolutely, it's a healthy fear. Not to give it an inch. Not to give it a thought. Not to give it a second. God's not talking about a fear of humans here. It's a fear of our own weakness or a fear of letting God down. Verse 16, I'm very happy now because I have complete confidence in you. Paul has suffered a great deal here and it was all worth it to him because the problem solved. It's hard to rebuild a shattered relationship. It's hard. Things you wished you hadn't said, things that came out in anger, things that weren't even true. Once they come out, that's a hard thing to fix. Paul is trying to do this fix and he's not even guilty and he doesn't justify not being guilty and trying. He has such a love that love, love covers a multitude of sin. Boy, I love that saying because doesn't it? And this is what he's trying to do in 2 Corinthians, especially in the last chapter and this chapter that we've read. Pastor, why have you spent so much time on it? Why are you detailing it this strongly? Because I don't want you to get in that kind of trouble. I don't want me to get in that kind of trouble. Even if you're doing really good right now, who knows what tomorrow brings? I want this to be planted into our minds and our thoughts I want us not to get tripped up on things that we don't see coming because it is going to come. And then what we do with it is the responsibility that God's given us. There's so many shattered relationships today in homes and churches and ministries and, and, and only when people will face the problems honestly and then deal with them biblically and lovingly and seek to get right with God can these things be fixed? As you and I examine our lives, we have to determine to be part of the answer and not part of the problem. We have to have appreciation in our life. We have to practice separation from the things of the world. And we have to encourage reconciliation if God is to use us to restore broken relationships. Although this chapter, all through it, we see how concerned Paul was about his relationship with the Corinthians. and shows that people were the most important part of ministry. And I've been in churches where the pastor forgot that. Rules and regulations 
ended up controlling the church. Um, the mind says, don't let the door hit your hiney on the way out has been the answer to problems instead of trying to find solutions. And when there isn't solutions, and sometimes going out the door but not, not letting it hit your hiney, knowing that as you go out the door, you're loved. And there will always be a relationship and, and, and a precious time that we serve together. That's how when people want something different, that things should happen. You have to remember that the reason for ministry is people. Our job is to help people rid of their sins, but never condemn them. Because we all have sins. We don't want them. And we need God and his strength and friendships and relationships to strengthen us from those things. I never want to stand here and say that I've got all this down, now you better. And I've watched pastors do that. We are a work in process, church. We are a work in a process. I want to be more like Jesus tomorrow than I am today. And I don't want anyone looking at me four years ago or 20 years ago or, or five minutes ago because I want to be better than I was that person five minutes ago. And it's a constant cleansing. It's a constant looking at myself. It's a constant looking at other people that are annoying you or frustrating you and thinking, whoa, how many times have I done that? When I understand what I've been forgiven of, when I understand what it took to pay for my sins, when I see God's grace towards me, if I can't have that for someone else, something is wrong with my walk with God. And, and I challenge you. I challenge him. As the worship team comes up, during the last song, worship, and any time you want to spend, if God's revealed to you an area, that you want worked on and you want prayer. There, there's someone that is never going to condemn you or never going to tell anyone else what you told them, but they would love to pray with you if you just want to sit with God and deal with it in your own place. I, I tell God I'm sorry a lot. <laughs> if you find yourself not telling God you're sorry a lot, something's not wrong with the way that you're really looking at yourself. I want to not tell God I'm sorry m better every year so there won't be so much time that we have to pray that way. And I can pray more on, thank you, Lord. I think we forget gratefulness. I think that's a challenge for all of us. We forget to be grateful. If we're grateful, we don't get discontent so easily. If we're grateful for what we have, and it almost always has to take a perspective. Jeez, I don't own a home as big as that person owns or I don't have a car as nice as that person or I don't have bank accounts with tons of money or I don't have the kind of investments that I don't get the clothes that that person has, right? Then, then, then discontentment, and I've even shared you within marriages. I'm not a counselor, you guys. You do God's obedience and everything gets better. I'm not good at counseling. There's good counselors. You counsel with me, it's one time. If you haven't got it right, I can't help you. If we're obedient to God, it fixes all the stuff. You've got to have someone that help you understand what's causing the stuff because everyone has childhoods and things that cause their adults to feel as adult different ways. But as soon as you understand that, then God has the answers for you to be able to do what's right. And it's just that simple for me in the way that I think. And that. So that's why I say if you want to meet with somebody for a long time and do that, there's people that can do that, but I can't. But what I'll tell a couple that's not happy with each other is I'll ask them before I see them the next time to write 10 things that they admire about each other. Because it's so easy to forget those. You know, the things that don't make you happy seem to consume us and discontent gets this little bit of space. And then all of a sudden those 10 things that you loved and saw and asked to be married aren't even seen anymore. 
And that perspective works in your church and your families and your relationships and your friends and everything else. All right, I've gone long and I've gone hard. But I pray that the Lord spoke to all of us. Would you stand with me? Love that song. He is a good, good father. And he accomplishes that thing that we strive for, and that's perfect. There's one day you and me will be. I long for that. Come quickly, Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May your week with him be sweet and tender. Father, remind us that you want to hear from us. Help us to remember to be grateful, Lord. And don't let these feet touch the ground when we get up in the morning. I want to start our day without asking the power of your Holy Spirit to live a life that just gives you what you deserve, Lord, and that's everything. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, the church said, God bless you guys.